In 1939, Hungarian physicist Leo Szilard intruded on Albert Einstein's sailing vacation to ask him to send a letter. That letter to President Franklin Roosevelt would warn him of the discovery of nuclear fission and the potential development of a Nazi atomic bomb. Months before, in a Berlin laboratory, German scientists realized that the nuclei of radioactive isotopes could be split into smaller parts, releasing a large amount of energy. It was feared that this discovery would lead to the development of a weapon that would allow Germany to win the war. The stakes during World War II were high. The Axis powers of Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, and Imperial Japan ignited a conflict that would eventually involve dozens of countries and ultimately claim more than 50 million lives. Famous European scientists like Szilard, Hans Bethe, and Enrico Fermi fled to Great Britain and America to avoid persecution in continental Europe. Few knew at the time that Szilard's letter, signed by Einstein, kicked into gear the fledgling American uranium research program. American scientists worked alongside their European counterparts at universities across the country. A report from the British claiming that a nuclear weapon could be completed in time to alter the outcome of the war also spurred policymakers to action. In December of 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States entered the war. President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill decided to consolidate their joint research efforts in the United States. The Manhattan Project was named for the location of its first headquarters in Manhattan, New York. The Army Corps of Engineers would oversee the project, which was established in August of 1942. A few months later, Enrico Fermi made history by initiating the world's first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction at the University of Chicago's Stagg Field. With enough material, a critical mass of uranium or plutonium produces a chain reaction that if controlled creates energy and if uncontrolled produces a powerful explosion. The work of the Manhattan Project was distributed in laboratories across the United States and at its peak would employ over 130,000 scientists, engineers, technicians, and other workers. Colonel Leslie Groves, who had just completed the building of the Pentagon on time and under budget, was chosen to lead the effort. Groves ordered that sites be found for the massive industrial complexes needed to create the fissionable materials necessary for an atomic bomb. The Clinton Engineer Works appeared almost overnight in the out-of-the-way hills and hollows of eastern Tennessee. In Washington State, the Hanford Engineer Works took over several towns on a bend in the Columbia River. Both places fit the criteria, far from population, lots of land, lots of water, and access to hydroelectric power. Makeshift cities were built seemingly overnight. Thousands of people began working non-stop in shifts to produce enough fissionable material for the new weapons. New technologies drove these wartime factories. In Tennessee, cyclotrons and diffusers concentrated U-235, the fissionable isotope of uranium. In Washington, B reactor the first full-scale production reactor in the world produced plutonium-239, the fissionable isotope of plutonium. As work progressed, it became clear that the project would also need a dedicated laboratory where scientists and engineers could collaborate to design and construct an atomic bomb. To serve as director of that facility, Groves, now a general, chose J. Robert Oppenheimer, the nation's leading theoretical physicist. Although very different in temperament and worldview, Grove saw that Oppenheimer had determination and focus to match his own. In the fall of 1942, the search for a suitable location began. Oppenheimer, who had vacationed in New Mexico, 
suggested Los Alamos for the Secret Weapon Design Laboratory, codenamed Project Y. Groves liked that it was impossibly remote, easy to secure, and away from coasts and potential attacks. But it was the Los Alamos Ranch School that convinced him. The ranch school had been built by Ashley Pond, a Teddy Roosevelt Rough Rider, as a frontier-style preparatory school for the sons of wealthy Easterners. The war effort took precedence over Ashley Pond's dream. The final class of the ranch school graduated quickly in February 1943 and moved out. They made way, along with the plateau's homesteaders, for Project Y's earth movers and construction crews. Local Pueblo groups, although not displaced through the official taking of land, were no longer allowed access to the plateau, effectively restricting their ability to practice centuries-old traditions. Ranch school buildings and homestead cabins were remade into improvised laboratories and workshops. A main laboratory site, established near the ranch school pond, began to take shape and scientific equipment from universities across the country was being requisitioned for Los Alamos. The first scientists, who arrived in April 1943, conceived of two different ways to assemble a critical mass inside a bomb the gun type method, and the implosion method. Early research focused on the simpler gun type assembly, which was thought to work with both uranium and plutonium. Physicist Emilio Segre quickly set up shop in two remote cabins at Pajarito site, where his radioactivity group could study the chemical properties of plutonium. The cabins were away from the boomtown bustle and interference from other experiments at the main site. The gun type assembly was being tested even farther up the mesa, where projectiles could be shot at high velocity and studied through a periscope. Ultimately, the gun type assembly, in which a mass of uranium is shot at another mass of uranium, worked. This design became Little Boy. More scientists and more engineers arrived, and Project Y started to look like a proper town. The roads were terrible, and the houses, except for the former ranch school buildings on Bathtub Row, were poorly constructed. But the scientists, their families, the women of the wax, and the army men in the special engineer detachment started to make a real community. Everyone came with a purpose or quickly found one. Accents from all over the country and all over the world could be heard in the labs and in the workshops. Wartime expediency meant that wives were encouraged to take jobs in the technical area using skills they had, doing science, administrative work, computation, sometimes contributing in unconventional ways for women of the time. For example, women worked as clerks, typists, and nurses, and as doctors, high explosive technicians, and chemists. The women of Los Alamos made considerable contributions to the project, but were still expected to keep the home fires burning and raise the children. People from the surrounding Hispanic and Pueblo communities were also essential to Project Y's success, recruited for housekeeping, maintenance, construction, and technical work. By August of 1944, it became clear from Segre's research that plutonium would never work in a gun-type assembly. The crisis of 44 brought with it Oppenheimer's reorganization of the project and the need for more workers and more facilities. The focus for the plutonium design shifted overnight, from the gun method to the more promising implosion method for critical assembly. This would become Fat Man. It sounds straightforward enough use an inward explosion, an implosion, to assemble a critical mass of fissionable plutonium by compressing it inward with synchronized explosions. But in practice, it was just the kind of monumental problem to challenge everyone, physicists, chemists, engineers, technicians, machinists. Implosion was so complex that Project Trinity was devised to test it. If successful, the Trinity test would be the first man-made atomic explosion. 
Creative ways had to be found to make specialized materials so that implosion would work. Gaining expertise with high explosives was essential. Kettles for making candy were used to mix up custom-made high explosives that could be precision molded into implosion lenses to focus the blast inward. To sync up the compressing force from each lens, circuits used to trigger the flash lamp in high-speed photography were used to trigger a detonator. The focused intellectual intensity, the long work days, and the urgency of the war made for vivid lives off hours. In their precious spare moments, the people of Project Y enjoyed hiking, skiing, horseback riding, and going to parties. People were young and energetic. The average age was just 29. Focusing on the end of the war, scientists threw the book at perfecting implosion. At Sagres Plutonium Research Site in Pajarito Canyon, two battleship bunkers were built near the pond cabin. These bunkers and their firing pads were used to detonate high explosive lens assemblies so scientists could learn what was happening inside the implosion. Was it compressing the sphere equally and with enough speed? The remote sites for studying implosion were scattered across the mesas south of town. High-speed cameras documented the tests. Imaging, along with high explosives, became a specialty of Los Alamos because observing and measuring the results was a crucial aspect of every test. They had to be certain of success. Plutonium was too rare to be wasted on a failed implosion. The war in Europe ended in May of 1945, but the United States was fighting fierce battles on its way toward the Japanese mainland. Project Y engineers worked with the military. Under Project Alberta, weapon delivery plans were underway to allow the new bombs to be dropped from B-29 bombers on Japan. V-Site was built down the road from Gunsight to test prototypes of the implosion weapon. Here, the high explosive sphere for the Trinity test device, called the Gadget, was assembled. The Trinity device was an experimental setup. It was meant to replicate all details of the Fat Man weapon, but would be detonated on a tower at Trinity site in southern New Mexico, instead of being dropped from an airplane. Over at Pajarito site, Edward Kreutz and his team put together a non-fissionable version of the gadget as a final test before Trinity. The lab's high explosives expert, George Kistiakowski, needed Kreutz's version to test his explosive lenses. Kreutz used the magnetic method of imaging to verify that the implosion lens setup would work. At first, results looked disastrous. The instrument said the implosion velocity was too slow. This was Saturday morning, just two days before the Trinity test, and the gadget was already at the tower. Hans Beta spent that day recalculating the results and realized that ionization of air inside the full-size Kreutz test assembly had changed the flow of data, indicating a slower velocity than had actually occurred. On Sunday morning, Beta phoned Trinity to say the math checked out. Kreutz's test was a success after all, and the design worked as planned. Early the next morning, on July 16th, they conducted the Trinity test and detonated the gadget. Whether at Trinity or at unofficial improvised viewing sites, the people of Project Y were the first to witness the dawn of a new era. On August 6th, the Enola Gay dropped the gun-assembled uranium weapon, Little Boy, on Hiroshima. On August 9th, the B-29 boxcar dropped the plutonium implosion bomb, Batman, on Nagasaki. The Manhattan Project had unleashed a destructive force never before seen. Each strike claimed tens of thousands of lives and left the cities in ruins. 
The devastation of these attacks, along with the Soviet entry into the war on August 8th, compelled the Japanese government to surrender unconditionally. After years of bloodshed, on August 14, 1945, World War II was over. The mission complete, Oppenheimer resigned as Project Y director, and hundreds returned to their pre-war lives. Into this void stepped Norris Bradbury, helping transition the laboratory into its new role of refining the nation's nuclear deterrent. The science, technology, and engineering achievements of Project Y laid the foundation for the work of the post-war laboratory. During the decades that followed, Los Alamos National Laboratory evolved into the multidisciplinary institution it is today, a place where scientists, like their wartime predecessors, apply their diverse skills to solving the nation's most pressing technical challenges.